Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we will be exploring creativity, spiritual epiphany, and psychic functioning. They may seem not quite related to each other, but my guest, Stephen Schwartz, has a bead on the common thread in all of these very significant states of human consciousness. Stephen is the author of The Secret Vaults of Time, The Alexandria Project, Opening to the Infinite, and the Eight Laws of Change, How to Become an Agent for Personal and Social Transformation. He is a parapsychology researcher, a founder of the International Remote Viewing Association, and a founder of the Society for the Anthropology of Consciousness. He is also a regular columnist for Explore, the Journal of Science and Healing. Welcome, Stephen. My pleasure. You often like to use the term non-local consciousness, meaning consciousness that's outside of the membrane of our skin. And uh, it seems to me that when we talk about creativity, spiritual epiphany, and psychic functioning, perhaps the link between those three is non-locality of consciousness. It is. It is. I got interested in this because initially I got interested, was genius a function of IQ? Now, you presume, most people, yeah. if you ask them, oh, well, I mean, geniuses are, you know, just have higher IQs. That would almost seem by definition to be the case. Yes, it would. Yeah. However, if you, the world IQ is 100. Yes. I mean, that's, that's the- By definition. By definition, the measurements are set up. And actually, some countries are more, some countries are less. Uh, the highest country is uh, South Korea. Uh, United States is 98. Mm -hmm. So we're not the best. We're not at the top. But uh, the we're world... a little below average. Uh, yeah, well, yes, actually. Um, below the world, 100 is the, being the world average. Mm -hmm. Well, if you think about that for a second, then let's say that in most of the psychological literature, genius is considered to be three standard deviations away, uh, so 145. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, 145. Well, if you actually look at the epidemiological data, what you discover is that about 27, 28,000 children are born every day who will have IQs of 145 or better. And they're certainly not all geniuses. Yes, but let's just stay with that thought okay. for a second. So, okay, you got 28,000 people that are born with an IQ of 145 or better. If I ask you to name all the creative geniuses that come to mind of being world historical mm -hmm. figures, and I've asked this of hundreds and hundreds of yeah. people, mm -hmm. I discover uh, we don't have to do it right here, but I discovered that most people, when they get to about 15 or 20, sort of run out of steam. You know, they do Leonardo, Michelangelo, Einstein, uh, uh, Picasso, uh, 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 well, Plunk, if he's, do they know who he is. Uh, uh, you see? Yeah. You start running out. Most people I've discovered from asking people this question and asking them to make a list for me can't get past 50. Well, there are, of course, many geniuses who are not oh, no. public figures. No, I understand. But mm -hmm. but of world historical figures, most people can't get past 50. Okay. Now, we got 28,000 thereabouts mm -hmm. who are born with this. So clearly, genius is not entirely a function of IQ. Right. Then I got interested in, uh, I was doing anthropological research and looking at uh, spiritual leaders. Mm -hmm. And 
And uh, of course, I do remote viewing research and, and, and therapeutic intention research, meditation research, mm -hmm. creativity. Those are my big research areas, th those, those four. Um, and I began looking at the accounts of people who have these spiritual epiphanies. Mm -hmm. And I had already been reading these uh, uh, experiences, these subjective reported experiences of people have genius. And, and of course, I knew about the remote viewers and, and others like that. Psychic functioning. Yeah, psychic yeah. functioning, a, a word I don't particularly like, but, mm -hmm. but nonetheless. And what suddenly dawned on me was they were all describing exactly the same experience. Uh, creative geniuses. Um, Einstein says that the experience of uh, his, the insight which gave him the theory of relativity occurred as he was whiling the way an afternoon in a canoe. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Henri Poincaré says he was walking across the street when suddenly, almost like a vision, he saw the solution to a mathematical problem he had been working mm -hmm. with for as I recall, Martin Luther was sitting on the toilet. That's right. Uh, Descartes uh, had, th on November the 10th, 1619, had three dreams from which his great insights came. Mm -hmm. uh, I was once down speaking at the Salk Institute, and I was walking across that wonderful campus that Louis Kahn designed for him, and I said to... Uh, so, you know, where did these ideas go? Where did the idea of the vaccine come from? And he said, oh, I do it in, I, I use my dreams. Mm -hmm. Robert Louis Stevenson said, my ideas come to me in my dreams. I give the gremlins of my mind, as he called them, mm -hmm. a suggestion. And during the night, I have a dream and I wake up, I write it down. And that's the beginning of my, of my novels. And I mean, you can do hundreds of these. So, so the the common thread here seems to be the these experiences come uh, in an unexpected way, uh, sort of bubbling up from the unconscious. These are non-local consciousness. They report, "I'm in a timeless time. I'm in a spaceless space." Whether it's spiritual insights, Jesus's story in the desert. Muhammad's story, Buddha sitting under his, the banyan tree, yeah. all of these accounts of these great spiritualists, they all describe, I'm in this sense of oneness, I'm in this sense of timeless time, spaceless space. You look at the accounts of hundreds of remote viewers. Yeah. What, what, what do you feel when you're really on, you know, you're right on target on the remote viewing, oh, I have this sense of, I'm in this some larger unity, and and it's just like there's no time. And and so over and over again, mm -hmm. if you look at these three things, uh, creative genius, spiritual epiphany, and psychic functioning, yeah. you see accounts again and again and again of the same elements. And then I took that research and began to explore it even deeper. And out of that um, came six steps that they all go through. Okay. And you can learn them, I discovered. So the first step is um, you must have the conviction that there, that there is a solution. Mm -hmm. Whether your problem is a mathematical problem or whether it's a spiritual conundrum or whether you're doing a rhyme or a remote view. Mm -hmm. You have to have a conviction you can get the answer. A positive expectation. A positive expectation. If you think things are hopeless, it may you know, be that you're not going to be able to enter into the proper state of consciousness to receive the answer that is there waiting for you. Well, that's exactly right. So the first thing is you must have you must have a conviction that you can experience the answer. Mm-hmm whatever the answer is. And, and the answer could be uh, a, a physical information, it could be spiritual information, it could be uh, whatever. a new invention or that, that it never be, existed. Or it could be describing a teacup in, hidden in a closet. Mm -hmm. the, so that's the first step. In, in, in other words, there's no limit to the possibility of acquiring uh, insight. That's right. So that's the first part. Mm -hmm. Second step. 
You must be willing to surrender all of your preconceptions. This is the tough one for most people. Yeah. You know, you and I know scientists for whom we have considerable respect and who are excellent scientists, but who have preconceptions about how the world works that they find it impossible to surrender. Mm -hmm. So these people that make these great creative breakthroughs, um, part of it is that they are willing, they are flexible enough to surrender their preconceptions. Yeah. yeah. I know Carl Jung once made an observation that everybody has at least one place where they can't let go. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we all have that somewhere, but what you're saying is when it comes to this important area, it's, it's necessary to be able to let go. Because otherwise, you can't really perceive the mm -hmm. insight that you're seeking yeah. because maybe it doesn't fit into the box that you are used to. Uh -huh. So you have to, second step, you have to be able to surrender preconceptions. Uh -huh. Or you won't be receptive. That's right. Third, you must have some technique of inward lookingness. Mm -hmm. That is, you must be able to attain and sustain intention focused awareness that will allow you to open to this non-local aspect of your, the non-physiological part of your consciousness. And in some of the cases you cited, it was pretty natural, like I'll go canoeing. Yes, or, or um, you were walking. What the hallmark of them is, you always seem to be in a kind of relaxed space, you're doing, you're walking across the street, you're, you're in the canoe, you're sleeping, uh, you're staring out at the mm -hmm. ocean, whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is no a way. There's yeah. just, it is a process that has these commonalities. Mm -hmm. So you have to have some technique of inward lookingness, whatever that is, meditation, whatever. Then you experience the ha aha moment they come in a flash. That's mm -hmm. the uh, thing that really caught my first attention. That, when I first began to think of these three, creativity, spiritual yeah. epiphany, psychic functioning, is that it comes in this timeless sense. Suddenly, you're kind of lost in thought, and this, this thing comes to you, whatever it is, that you are holding the intention to get, and it sort of happens. Uh, you know, you have a dream, you have a vision, you have, uh, uh, but you experience some sense of connection with the greater whole uh -huh. in a timeless space. Mm -hmm. Now, I was telling you uh, yesterday, I think it was, or the day before, about a dream that changed my life. And I remember distinctly uh, waking up from that dream, and I could have said it out loud, Eureka. I knew I had the answer, <laughs> even though at the moment I, I woke up, I didn't know yet what the answer was. Right. That's the aha moment. Mm -hmm. And then, finally, you have to be able to explicate and help others replicate. Mm-hmm. By explicate, I mean you've got to be able to explain it in a way that other people can understand it mm -hmm. and in a way that other people can replicate what you have done. And because in spiritual epiphany and in creative uh, genius, psychic functioning less so, although as we have discussed in other conversations, the you know the use of oracular people in uh, oracles in culture mm -hmm. uh, do this so you must be a explicate and replicate because the experience itself is specific to an individual mm -hmm. one individual has it yes one individual saw relativity one individual had this spiritual epiphany you know, Jesus describes his experiences, Muhammad describes his, Buddha describes his, all of these, it's always the same. And once you explicate, once you explain it, it has to be attuned to the culture in which it occurs. Mm -hmm. Because if you are premature to the culture, people can't hear you. An example of that, in 1492, Leonardo was excavating the San Marco Canal to increase. Leonardo spent a lot of his time devising uh, defensive 
uh, uh, military structures. Yes, yes, he did. Mm -hmm. And he was digging out the San Marco Canal in order to strengthen the the city structures, and um, and he began to dig up fossils. Mm -hmm. And most people, you know, thought they were uh, the, my the frozen fairies. That was one. Seminal gust, although whose <laughs> semen is never mentioned. <laughs> but anyway, people had all kinds of crazy ideas because they would dig up fossils, mm -hmm. but they simply couldn't conceive of them as what they are. Yeah. Leonardo looked at them and understood what they were. And he tried to talk about it, but he was premature. Mm -hmm. Nobody could, yeah. nobody could uh, uh, see what he was seeing. Uh, if you think about, I, uh, about Edison, for instance, 37 people apparently uh, came up with the idea for the light bulb at about the, because the, the, there's prematurity and also simultaneity. Mm -hmm. uh, Alfred Russell, Russell Wallace and Charles Darwin got to the idea of evolution at about the same time. Yeah. Um, so there's, it's as if, it's as if a culture becomes pregnant with an idea. Mm-hmm. And several people have it because there's a mortality rate. Yeah. So if you're premature, if you come too soon, like like Leonardo, or for that matter, uh, Charles Darwin's uh, a grandfather's uh, uh, came up and wrote a poem call, uh, called Zoonomia. His his, oh. his part of the problem was his choice of 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 prose form was poetry. So. Yeah. You know, you don't associate that with science, but it contained many of the elements of evolution. So you have this personal experience mm -hmm. of non-local consciousness that gives you this insight and you explain it to people and the culture has to be ready to hear it because these insights are personal experiences, but their uh, development as religions or scientific truths or whatever is a matter of social acceptance. Yeah. So it's not just that the individual has the experience, it's that it has to be, it has to find social acceptance. And, and of course, when we're talking about psychic functioning, uh, we're still in an environment today where many people with psychic gifts run up against the wall of uh, yes. social uh, yeah. ostracism and marginalization. Yes, exactly. So you, you have to have social acceptance in order for it to work. The result was that if you can learn these steps mm -hmm. and apply them, you have to adapt them. You can't do them. It's not like a cookbook, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a, a cup of this and two tablespoons of that. But if you take the principles of these six steps, these six processes, you can develop the ability to produce creative insights. Mm -hmm. Now, IQ plays a role, but it's not the dispositive role, yeah. because if it was, we'd have lots more Leonardos and Einsteins. And well, it's one thing to be very, very smart, and it's another thing to combine that uh, intellect with uh, a creative vision. Yes. I mean, a lot of people who are very, very smart hold quite ordinary jobs and have mm -hmm. quite ordinary lives in that sense. Yeah. I mean. Uh, for instance, Mensa, uh, I think the IQ is, I think they want a high 132, yeah. and there are a number of thousands of people that belong to Mensa. I've spoken to the groups, Mensa groups, very nice people, but I can't immediately call to mind any major creative geniuses that come out of Mensa who list Mensa as their sufficient organization. So I'm very glad that they find each other and, yeah. and that they have a good time as a, as a group. But the truth is, uh, IQ alone won't get you there. Yeah. And, and having an insight alone won't get you there because you have to be willing uh, to be able to explain it. And because this is a social phenomena as much as an individual phenomena, you must have it at a time when other people mm -hmm. can hear what you're saying. And we also note, as I said, that um, there is this odd phenomena 
of simultaneity in which you'll go along for years and years and nobody will be able to solve a problem and all of a sudden a whole bunch of people will solve it. Yeah, problem. sometimes referred to as the zeitgeist. Yeah. The spirit of the time. That's right. And um, and then there are issues. Uh, Sweetbert Ertel, a German mathematician, uh, has done a lot of research on, for instance, the relationship between the Earth's geomagnetic field, uh, solar activity, mm -hmm and uh, creativity, finding that when the solar activity is stable and the Earth's geomagnetic field is, is unperturbed, mm -hmm. that there are these clusters of creative moments all over the world. They, they don't just happen in one place. They are planetary-wide. There will be these leaps forward. The and ecology of consciousness. That's right. Mm -hmm. and, and, and an example that I know you're familiar with, you look at the Axial Age. Yes. The Axial Age uh, is, a, uh, historians all know this. Actually, very few scientists know it, in my experience. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but historians are familiar with it. That's the 8th to the 2nd century BCE. And in that period of time, um, the Buddha... Confucius, Lao Tzu, Thales of Athens, uh, Hebrew uh, prophets, he, the, uh, Deutero Isaac, yeah. uh, Judaism, uh, the, the, yeah, the Hebrew prophets, all over the world within uh, really a space of about 200, it goes from the 8th to 2nd, but mm -hmm. it's really about 200 years. Within that 200 year period, there is a complete change in human consciousness. Mm -hmm. The rise of Greek philosophy. Greek philosophy, yeah. the whole concept of democracy, all of that. Uh, uh -huh. All happens in this, I mean, geologically across the millions of years and or even the thousands of years that, of human history, there's this little tiny period mm -hmm. in which there's this enormous shift in consciousness mm -hmm. that occurs all over the planet. Yeah. Um, we are, I think, looking at a phenomena that whose essence is the ability to open to non-local consciousness mm -hmm. and to understand what uh, uh, you, with the insight that you get, and to be able to explain it to others yeah. and have them be able to accept it. Once we understand those steps and that process, then it is incumbent upon mm -hmm. us, if we would like to improve our lot, to begin to cultivate that because what I have discovered in the research that I've done is that um, this is a learn this is a learnable process and you can put it to work and make it work for uh, the well-being of not only yourself but others and you know, we've discussed in earlier conversations about the role psychophysical psychophysiology of politics, the manipulation of the of 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 neuroscience mm -hmm. insights in the political process, which is a, a way of bringing human beings into a state which is almost the uh, polar opposite of non-local that, consciousness. That, that's that was what I was going to say. So, but the the use of these scientific insights to produce social transformation, that's really where I'm headed, mm -hmm. just as we can manipulate it to produce negative outcomes, because we know that stress and fear and confusion produce more conservative outcomes, so by creating well-being and, and recognizing how people make contact with this creative part of themselves, so we can create an environment in which these insights are fostered and we can have more of them and we can have the possibility of gaining insights that will improve the use and the lives and happiness of humanity. Well, Stephen, I'm very glad we're having this conversation. I think it comes at a time when when its uh, utility is obvious to, to many, many people. And I think uh, what you're doing in this conversation and some of the earlier conversations that we've had is sort of setting the standard for uh, where to go next, what to do next. And I hope that it is life-affirming, compassionate, and fostering of well-being.
and uh, you stand for that, you embody it, it's, it's part of your beingness, and it is my great pleasure to have been able to share that with our viewing audience. My pleasure. Thank you, Stephen, and thank you for being with us. Thank you.